Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Getting back to work on Wall Street after a long weekend. Following a four-day winning streak on the S&P, do we snap that today? Future softer by a third of 1%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, Morgan Stanley wrapping up Q4 bank earnings. Investors hoping for better data out of China and Goldman Sachs bulled up on global commodities. We begin with the big issue. What a difference a rally makes. This is a rally, no doubt. Huge rallies to start the year. There is a lot of optimism on demand. Some real optimism airing in. The outlook for the world economy, I think, is actually improving. At the same time, yields moving lower, so bonds rallying. The hallmarkings of a uh, January effect. It's that kind of bond equity rally that's the perfect storm for the US dollar. And perhaps there's a little bit too much complacency on what central banks are going to do. We're looking at economic data. The US is doing great. We're looking at earnings data. There's been a lot of fear mongering coming into earnings. Right? We're seeing more optimism now here uh, over from China. The reopening of China, it's finally happening. Rising tide lifts all boats. As a result, you have to be careful, you have to place your bets. Joining us now to discuss is Alliance Bernstein's Gershon Distenfeld, Troy Kaeski of FS Investments. Gents, thanks for being with us to kick off the trading week. What a difference a quick rally makes to start a new year. And let's go there, Troy. I'm looking at European equities up almost 10% year to day. EM equities have ripped, you've seen that. Copper prices are running as well. And all of a sudden, Troy, we're not talking about recession, we're talking about recovery. Are we talking about the right thing? Well, look, I mean, clearly in sustained bear markets, you have powerful bear market rallies like you've always had historically. And clearly there's reason for optimism, particularly around the fact that inflation and CPI in particular has come down, as you know, and that has opened the door for the Fed to only hike 25 basis points uh, at, at the next meeting. You know, however, you know, in the big picture, it still looks highly likely that once we get through Q1 and Q2 and the labor market finally cracks, the probability of U.S. recession is still relatively high. And again, in the background, as we focus on these mini uh, cycles up and mini cycles down, uh, the Fed is still draining their balance sheet at an aggressive pace, money supply shrinking, and it's very hard to have a sustainable bull market with money supply contracting because the liquidity that drives asset prices higher is being gradually sucked out of the U.S. economy. In the meantime, is the pain trade still up? This was BFA this morning in their fund manager survey. The first quarter risk asset pain trade remains up. Gershon, do you agree with that? I, I just think we're going to continue to have a lot of volatility in markets. What still remains through, all, through this rally is this dichotomy between what the market expects the Fed to do and what the Fed expects the Fed to do, or at least based on their, their current information. You know, clearly the market is still priced being cut later this year, uh, and the, the Fed says they're going to be resolute. And as, and as encouraging as some of the CPI numbers were, the labor market is still very, very strong. I heard Bob Michelle earlier talk about the Fed going to 6% or even higher. I think I'm not calling that as a base case, but the probability of that, in my mind, is higher than it is that the Fed's going to start the cut rates this year. So as you get every new piece of information, I think you're going to see volatility in the markets. You're going to see, you know, sell-offs. You're going to see rallies and continued volatility, especially the longer end of the, of the rate curve. Well, let's talk about the rally that we're seeing in high-yield credit, Gershon. That's your world. I think we've tightened 60-plus basis points year to date. And there's a little bit of a gap emerging here. There's another spread, Gershon. It's the spread between what we're seeing in the soft data, the survey data, terrible and what we're seeing take place in credit markets great rally on what do you make of that yeah i think john we talked about this last time i was on you know the, the, there's a very strong correlation between spreads and and pmi and you know we're seeing that even widen uh, more you know spreads should be widening here so that is troubling to us um we still think that corporate fundamentals are in a very good place to start but um you know if, if we are going into recession that is going to increase the fault um, we don't think anywhere to the levels like maybe the market is implying. But spreads at this point, I think, are fairly valued at best. Do you think, Troy, ISMs improve or credit spreads need to widen? This is exactly what Gershon and I talked about last time we spoke. Which one is it? Yeah, credit spreads need to widen. I mean, 
Uh, to Brian's point, the, the probability of a default cycle, anything like we had in the global financial crisis or 2002, is exceptionally low because even the event of recession is going to be rel relatively mild. And remember, nominal GDP drives revenue, not real GDP growth. And unless inflation collapses overnight, we're still going to have positive nominal GDP. So, you know, we've been uh, articulating more of a three, four, five percent peak in default rates. Uh, but when you look across the fixed income complex now and you compare high yield bonds to, say, agency pass throughs, you're getting much more income per unit of credit risk in agency pass throughs than you certainly are in high yield bonds. Troy, can you explain what agency pass throughs are? Just for people yeah, who might sure. not be so, familiar so, with any of that. Uh, yeah, that, that's the principal financing mechanism for the U.S. housing market. And, you know, if you they're uh, implicitly and now explicitly guaranteed by the U.S. government. Um, and so effectively, you look over history, you know, in 2008, that market got smoked because credit quality was so terrible and the agencies were effectively insolvent. Uh, but now you still have excellent credit quality in the housing market. And as home prices decline, obviously, LTVs will go higher. But the underwriting standards have been so much tighter this time around that the risk of actual loss uh, is exceptionally low. And so that's been more of a technical driven by uh, massive volatility in interest rates and QT. Uh, whereas what we're talking about with high yield is the very high probability of defaults going up and realizing some degree of losses to offset your income stream. And we just don't see that happening in agency mortgage backed securities. And there's a theme here, though. Even in high yield, I hear the same thing, Gershon, that things are better quality this time around, that these asset classes will be more resilient to an economic turndown. Is that your view, too? That is my view. Um, you know, double Bs are the highest percent of the market they've been in a long time. And... You know, not all defaults are created equal. So the average dollar price of the triple of a triple C today is seventy three cents on the dollar. It's very different if a company that's let's say trading at uh, it's an average trading at sixty defaults and recovers at forty. That's not pleasant, but that's very different than a surprise default if a very high quality company all of a sudden has trouble. So I, I think a lot of defaults, close to seven percent defaults the way we calculated are priced into the market. So I don't think it's as gloom and doom. I'm not very bullish on spreads in the near term. But yields matter also. Now, maybe hopefully this is not too technical, but you know the correlation between spreads and the change on the curve is pretty close to zero over time in the high yield market. So yields are important. It is different if you know when the when the uh, when the ten is at one and a half percent and spreads were at three fifty, so you had five percent. It's different than today where the ten years at three and a half percent and spreads are four twenty five. All in yield is an important indicator and it is on the higher side of what we've seen over the past 10 years. It's a massive change, that's for sure, over the last couple of years. Equity futures right now down about two tenths of 1%, going into the open about 23 minutes away. Mike McKee, the data this morning, let's call it what it was ugly. It certainly was. You were talking at the top of the show about whether we're talking about uh, recovery or recession. Well, the folks in the New York manufacturing business are talking about recession, a big collapse in the New York Fed's Empire Index. Business conditions dropped to negative 32.9 from negative 11.2. That is the lowest since the peak of the pandemic drop off. And it's the kind of numbers we saw during the great financial crisis. New orders also collapsing to negative 31. 1.1 employment falls and prices paid drop to 33 from 50.5 now that could be a key here if we are talking about recession and maybe this is the combined result of everything that the fed has done so far and manufacturing is going to have a bad patch but prices come down well then that's what the fed is looking for so maybe overall it's not that bad a report. Uh, you'll have to make your decisions. It is a tertiary report, John. It's not the most important thing, and it doesn't always carry over to other ISMs, but it is a bit of an eye-opener. The PMIs right now are just not great, Mike, that's for sure. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. The team at Deutsche Bank thinks things are getting better, not worse. That doesn't mean things are good. That means things are getting better and not worse. There's an important distinction here, and it's true of Europe as well. Here's the line from them. They no longer expect a recession. We still expect, notwithstanding the much more shallow growth dent in the winter half, subdued recovery momentum during the year. We now expect annual GDP growth to stagnate in 2023. Now, Troy, that last line apparently is good news, that they expect annual GDP growth in Germany to stagnate in 2023 because previously they expected recession. This is the difference, Troy. You know, for markets, it's not good or bad, yes. it's better or worse. Are things getting better and not worse? 
Well, certainly in Europe, I mean, it's really remarkable how resilient their economy has been to the significant shocks, obviously tied to primarily energy, but also slowing global growth. And remember, Germany in particular has been more exposed historically to China's growth and obviously China's slowdown. So that's uh, undoubtedly, uh, I would say, great news for Europe, um, because if Europe can avoid a recession, and you and Tom were talking about this earlier today, that means you know net export growth for the U.S. Uh, could improve. And, and it further reduces that left tail of a more severe recession or hard landing um, and increases the probability that uh, GDP in the U.S. will either stagnate or only contract very, very mildly. So I, I think undoubtedly fantastic news, given all the headwinds that Europe has faced, you know, the last six months. This is the problem people have got right now, Gershon. Are we pricing in recovery or recession? I guess the answer is it depends where you look. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I again, I, I think the markets are just have a very, very different view than the Fed. Uh, it really does depend where you look. Um, you know, it, on one hand, if we're going to recession, bond yields at the long end of the curve are still too high. Uh, probably equity markets are too high. If we're not going to recession, then it's kind of the opposite. So again, I think as every piece of data comes in, we're gonna it's gonna tell us part of the story. I think one thing that I like to, to that, that kind of bugs me when people talk about what is the Fed going to do a year from now? It, if they're prudent, which they are, it should be based on what the data is telling them. We'll see if we're in recession. We'll see how fast inflation comes down. You know, I'm fearful inflation is not going to come down nearly as fast as uh, as as the Fed ex as what well, certainly the market expects, but maybe even the Fed expects. So we're going to have to really parse every piece of information that comes in, see the entire mosaic. And markets will react accordingly. Gershon, I know we have to make conversations efficient, but I think we shorten them down by saying if it's not a recession, this happens. If it is a recession, this happens. Are we really waiting for a group of economic nerds to sit around a table and say, yes, that was a recession, and then work out where a market should be? And the reason I ask this is because when we say recession, Gershon, what do we actually mean by that? When we describe that, are we talking about unemployment climbing 100 basis points, and that means the market outcome should be X and not Y? Which one is it? That's a great point, Jonathan. I, another thing that you hit another pet peeve of mine, people talk recession or, or not recession like there's this line. And, you know, if we're a little bit to the left of it, we're in recession. A little bit to the right of it, we're not in recession. Uh, you know, it, it's a combination of all of those things. It's a combination of where the labor markets are. It's, a com it's GDP growth. There's a very big difference between, you know, slightly negative GDP growth for a couple of, of quarters versus, you know, a sustained multi-year, you know, deep I won't use the word recession, but downturn. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I think that's exactly right, Jonathan. And we we have to we have to be careful. We talk about absolutes, and we we pretend like there's this line, and and it's in other places in the market too. Maybe in my area, this line between investment grade and high yield, it's completely artificial. It was made up by rating agencies and insurance companies many decades ago. And the same thing here. Does it really matter if we're in the technical definition of recession? Let's look at where the overall economy is all the moving parts of it, where markets are, and make our assessment from there. I'm guilty of it too, and we've all got to do better when we have this conversation. Troy, final word, please. Yeah, so it, 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 it's interesting uh, with regard to inflation, because obviously folks have been uh, very much cheerful about the decline in CPI, but, but remember, 80% of the U.S. economy is services. And last we checked, you know, in December, we hit a 40-year high in service uh, inflation at X shelter And so that gets back to this point that, you know, once inflation uh, spreads to labor and services, it's much harder to break. And, and some of the joy over the Fed potentially cutting, or sorry, hiking by only 25 and maybe stopping at 475 to 5, may be a little too optimistic uh, given the fact that inflation is fully spread to labor and services right now. We're going to continue this conversation. Troy Gershon sticking with us a little bit later. Don't miss this. Chancellor Schultz sitting down with our editor in chief, John Micklethwaite, a little bit later today at 10.30 Eastern time, 3.30 p.m. in London. A conversation you do not want to miss as banks start to line up. Goldman, no recession in Europe. Deutsche Bank, no recession in Germany. How bad is it going to be? I guess we'll find out. Coming up, OPEC bracing for China's big reopening. We're already falling behind. We've said this before. We need today to invest just to keep production at current levels. That conversation, up next.
falling behind. We've said this before. We need today to invest just to keep production at current levels, let alone cater for additional demand, which we see rising by at least 10 million barrels a day by 2045. OPEC anticipating a pickup in demand as the reopening of China continues. Goldman's Jeff Curry seeing a perfect setup for commodities, saying the following You can't come up with a more bullish concoction for commodities. The lack of supply is apparent in every single market you look at, whether it's inventories at critical operating levels or production capacity. Manus has been leading the effort over in Danville, Switzerland on this conversation. Manus joins us right now. Manus, great to catch up with you, buddy. Just walk me through how balanced these guys think this market is right now. Well, if you listen to Masrui, who's the UAE oil minister, uh, over the weekend at the Atlantic Council, he talks about a balanced market. Secretary General uh, Haitham al Gaith was here this morning, his first Davos, my first Davos. Jonathan, you remember yours. Um, much more cautious. I thought he would have been much more bullish on China. He lived in China. He knows China. That's why I put a store of value on what he's got to say. And it was a cautionary tale. Are you red, amber or green on the global demand cycle. He says there's hints of green, but you don't get confirmation of the green shoots, which plays into that bullish Goldman call on commodities until later in the year. And that's 500,000 barrels a day for China. That's way below Pierre Andrian's mega bull call uh, in the millions. Uh, and even Goldman's, you know, bullies prize, so to speak, in terms of China demand. Jonathan, I think it's just too early. And by the way, listen to your last conversation. Are we in recession? Recovery. I put it to you, Mr. Farrell. It's a reality check. It's not necessarily doom and gloom. It's a reality check of less savings, a little bit of restraint, and that doesn't lead you to a sort of Damocles decline. But China reopening is key. A market recovery always helps, Manus. It always helps. Manus Cranny of Bloomberg over in Davos, Swiss. The Manus, as always, sir. Good to catch up. Back with us for a final thought, I'm pleased to say, Troy and Gershon. Gershon, you mentioned Bob Michael at JP Morgan. I wanted to bring you the quote from the conversation the team here at Bloomberg had with him. He said this, the delayed and cumulative impact of all the tightening that we're seeing ultimately will bite and create a recession. It's incredibly aspirational to think we are going to get away with that. He offered a little bit more detail on this. He said the equation is inflation doesn't come down until wages do. Wages don't come down until employment rises. Unemployment doesn't rise unless we are in recession. Can you weigh in on that, Gershon? Well, I can summarize that by just saying that um, financial markets and data works with a leg. And, you know, and that's, that's the problem the Fed is in right now and that their actions to date, remember, we own, we're in January now. We got to only 2% on the Fed funds rate in August, and I believe 3% in September or October. Uh, and we think monetary policy works with like a six to 12 month lag. So we haven't really been in restrictive territory for very long. I think what Bob is saying, and I, I tend to agree with it, is there's been a lot of liquidity taken out of the system. We haven't seen the full effects of it yet, and we are likely to as 2023 develops. So I think financial markets need to be on alert. It's not all doom and gloom, but just because we're seeing somewhat decent numbers today, Pick your measure, whatever it is, doesn't mean that that's what we're going to see three to six months from now. Gershon, when you say that financial markets need to be on alert, is there a specific part of financial markets that perhaps need to be on more alert than others? Um, no, it's probably most visible in, in options pricing. Um, you know, I'm not sure, the le given all the information we have, I'm not sure the level of either rates at the long end or the equity markets are that off from what we, we consider fair value. But I think that volatility at the tail has definitely increased, especially that left tail. And it's something that I think the market is going to, to have to pay attention to. And that's why my base view, more so than markets going to rally or sell off, rates going to go here or there, yeah. is that we're going to continue to see elevated volatility, probably even more than, than, uh, than VIX and, and other options indicators are implying. Troy, do you agree? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, again, another reason to think that this might be an unsustainable uh, bear market rallies is how much the VIX has collapsed and volatility pricing in general. I mean, if the VIX was still at 30, 35 right now and and sentiment hadn't improved so dramatically like it has the two weeks, uh, the last two weeks, you could think there'd be more legs to this. Um, but unfortunately, you know, uh, defensive positioning has declined across all markets. And, you know, the one thing we'd say, we haven't talked about earnings, but if you, if you look at earnings so far, uh, you know, what you've seen is the power of a wealth management franchise at a Morgan Stanley, you know, tribute to Andy Saperstein, Ben Heineke, and Jeremy Beal. And then the flip side is, you know, if you look at Bank of America in particular, tremendous consumer data, day to day, 
they were the most wildly bullish on the U.S. consumer and the U.S. economy going back two quarters. And, and that tune started to change in lot Q3 earnings. And now in Q4, you know, their base case is a U.S. recession. And even though the labor market and the consumer lags, you have seen substantial deterioration in excess savings. You've seen substantial deterioration in the savings rate. Um, obviously, uh, you still have 1.7 uh, job openings for unemployed, uh, but the trend is still down. And, and the labor market is really the last uh, major economic item to crack in a downturn like we're going through. Resilient so far. Those cracks still to be expected maybe later this year. Troy, Gershon, great to catch up with both of you. Thanks for being with us. Just there you heard Troy mention the earnings. This from Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley this morning. I'm sure many of you have seen it. If you haven't, I'll share it with you now. What a quote. Bear markets are like a hall of mirrors designed to confuse investors and take their money. Trust your fundamental process for us. Margins and earnings are likely to significantly disappoint whether there is a recession or not. That line there, bear markets are a hall of mirrors designed to confuse investors and take their money. Is this just a bear market rally? We'll keep building on that conversation. The latest from Mike Wilson. An equity bear, at least in the near term, over at Morgan Stanley. Coming up, the morning calls in later. Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley wrapping up big bank earnings. More on that with Stephen Chuback of Wolf. Plus, we'll catch up with Chanel Desai of Franklin Templeton. Chanel thinks people are getting a little bit too excited too soon about inflation rapidly decelerating. That conversation coming up shortly. Equity futures down by a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P. No drama here. In the bond market, the curve a little bit steeper. Your 10-year high by four basis points. Your yield there, 354. Your two-year, your yield lower by a basis point to about 422. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Day winning streak on the S&P 500. Does that break today? Equity futures right now. No drama here. We're down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, down about a tenth of 1% also. That's the price action. Let's get you some morning calls. Three of them. The first one from Wells Fargo. Downgrading Pfizer to equal weight, highlighting the stock's expensive valuation and growing threats to near-term margins. That stock's negative 2.4%. Next up, JMP Securities downgrading Snap to market perform, expecting weaker user engagement amid increasing competition. 973 on that name. We're down about 7 tenths of 1%. And finally, Piper Sandler downgrading Bank of America to underweight, forecasting a challenging year ahead with limited visibility and weakening net interest income. We're down about 1% to 34.88. Coming up, Goldman wrapping up big bank earnings with a miss. We're breaking down the results with Wolf Stephen Chuback, who downgraded the shares just two weeks ago. Plus, Franklin Templeton's son of Desai joined us for more around the opening bell. Your opening bell, just around the corner. The long weekend is over stateside. The opening bell about 20 seconds away. Going into it, futures just about turning positive on the S&P after a four-day winning streak on the S&P. Believe it or not, four days on the S&P 500. The longest daily winning streak going back to September, following the biggest weekly gain on the S&P since early November. Futures just about positive going into that bell. The opening bell rings, switch on the board and get to the bond market. Yields looking like this. Going into retail sales later this week at four basis points on a 10-year 354.39. Curve a little bit steeper this morning. Dollar a little weaker again going into the BOJ in the next couple of days. Euro dollar 108.63, positive four tenths of 1% on Euro dollar. Some Euro strength. A couple of names in the last week or so. First, it was Goldman dropping their Eurozone recession call. Deutsche Bank dropping its German recession call. The Euro stronger this morning and crude rallying. Looking at 81, having a little look at 81 after going through 80 earlier on today. $80 and about 99 cents turns to 81 right now on the screen. I waited for it at 1.4% on a session. About 40 seconds into this, equities unchanged on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a tenth of 1%. One sector to watch out the open of financials once again. Goldman, Morgan Stanley wrapping up earnings season for the big U.S. banks. Kelly Lines has more. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Yeah, these two stocks moving in different directions at the opening bell. Goldman down about 2.5% after its net revenue came up short of expectations. They're getting hit by this lump in deal making, plus that consumer business that lost about $2 billion in 2022. And all of that hurting the top line at the same time that costs are going up. 
operating expenses jumped 11 percent, compensation playing a massive role in that. That rose by about 16 percent, and the bank upped provisions for credit losses as well. One bright spot helping to cushion that blow a bit is FIC trading, which actually jumped 44 percent to $2.7 billion. Interestingly, Morgan Stanley, on the other hand, which is up about 4 percent at the bell, missed estimates on both FIC trading and equities trading, though that equity trading revenue figure of $2.2 or so billion dollars is still the highest on Wall Street. And the real highlight here is wealth management. Net revenue there topping estimates, bringing in about $6.6 billion, benefiting from higher net interest income as the Fed has been pushing up rates. So all of that helped revenue overall to narrowly beat estimates. It came in at about $12.7 billion. Still, though, that is down 12 percent year over year. So this bank has actually seen negative revenue growth in every quarter of the last year. So we'll see, John, if that starts to turn around. Obviously, the financials facing a tough picture as we talk about potentially the recession question. Recession, I say, John. Recession. I keep hearing the same things. Kelly, thank you. As always, thank you very much. Morgan Stanley up by almost 4%. Goldman down by about 2.5%. Let's get you some commentary from the C-suite. This is from David Solomon over at Goldman Sachs. Against the challenging economic backdrop, we deliver double-digit returns. Our clear near-term focus is realizing the benefits of our strategic realignment, which will strengthen our core businesses, scale our growth platforms, and improve efficiency. A lot of corporate speech, Shanali, for you to translate. Uh, I will translate it for you very quickly right now. That double digit return is above expectations for the return on equity, and it sets him up to talk about it more at Investor Day at the end of February. Remember, 10%, even though it beat, it is below that median term goal. I do want to switch over here for a conversation about Morgan Stanley really quickly because you did see compensation expenses also rise there, but not at every unit. And you also saw it rise less than you saw in the fourth quarter over at Goldman Sachs. It's an expense story, there's no question about it. When you hear Morgan Stanley see James Gorman talk about it on the call with investors right now. He's saying that, you know, we're not really heading into a dark period. We want to feed the beast is what he is saying, <laughs> which is classic James Gorman. And so what you're saying is hearing these bank executives saying we still need to spend, guys. Uh, take it easy, because even though revenue is under pressure in some serious business lines, they still need to be adding headcount. They need to be taking on risk. Speaking of risk, they did get questions very specifically on how much Twitter was the reason for that more than $350 million write down that they saw mark to market write down. Uh, they're not going to comment here on single names, but it does beg the question on what kind of dry powder it gives you for a bank like Morgan Stanley to recapture um, that ability to keep feeding the beast once James Gorman says that mergers and acquisitions will come back. Shanali, let's put a bow on it. The court is up. What's the big takeaway for you? Uh, we're still waiting to hear from David Solomon speak to investors. Listen, that expense line, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's something to swallow at a time where you're still delivering bonuses that will be less than some people would have wanted. You also have Mike Mayo, who's uh, very upset about the woefully short disclosures over there at Goldman Sachs. Again, the tension that creates for you ahead of Investor Day is pretty dramatic. Shanali, looking forward to your coverage of that. In a few weeks' time, that stock's down by a little more than 2% over at Goldman. Wolf Research's Stephen Chuback downgrading Goldman and Morgan Stanley only two weeks ago. In anticipation of today's results, he wrote the following. Morgan Stanley and Goldman have been among our favourite stocks, but we see a number of risks emerging given elevated market sensitivity, capital markets headwinds, and higher capital under Basel IV international banking reform. Outside of valuation, we struggle to build a strong investment case for the banks. Stephen, I'm pleased to say joins us right now. Stephen, great to catch up, sir. So, do these numbers reinforce the position you had coming into this release? Yeah, um, no, thanks so much for having me on. Um, as it relates to like our expectations coming into the release, um, we saw really strong activity on the trading side, investment banking activity, of course, a bit more muted. Um, but as you guys were alluding to earlier um, in the discussion, it's really about expense control as it relates to Goldman as well as higher credit costs. So thinking about it more holistically, how is that going to impact the outlook for returns? And I, I would say that there's been some disappointment uh, based on the feedback that we've gotten as it relates to both the higher credit costs at Goldman, as well as the elevated expenses. And David has made it pretty clear that he's committed to their longer term targets around ROTC, around efficiency. And so the investor day is gonna be critical in them demonstrating their ability to put 22 and some of the headwinds, particularly towards the back half behind them, and demonstrate an ability to take that low double digit return to somewhere closer to the mid-teens. Stephen, who do you think has taken their medicine and put the bad news behind them and set up conservatively enough to perform this year? 
I mean, I actually think that Goldman did a pretty good job um, this quarter of kitchen sinking it, for lack of a better term. Certainly feels like they built substantial reserves, did what they needed to to take the pain on the severance side, on the comp side, and be able to improve the returns from here. I mean, uh, Morgan Stanley, I think it was more about their ability to deliver improved returns in wealth management in a relatively challenging backdrop. The big debate that's emerging is Morgan Stanley seems to suggest the management team that NII has not peaked. That's quite a bit different than what we've heard from some of the other big banks. So and so our expectation is that funding pressures are going to continue to build. Morgan Stanley had a more uh, optimistic tone as it relates to the NII outlook. So that was a big differentiator relative to what we heard from the big banks, certainly driving some of this strength today in terms of what we're seeing on the tickers. So, Stephen, this raises a big question, and it's a broad one, so forgive me for asking such a broad question, but how should these names be valued? It's tough because in a recessionary backdrop, you'd argue that we should be looking at price to tangible book multiples. And on that basis, Goldman trading somewhere between 1.2, 1.3 of tangible, if you believe they can deliver a mid-teens ROTC, that would suggest that the valuations are relatively attractive. The big problem is the regulators are going to increase capital requirements on some of the big banks, something called Basel III Endgame. It is very complicated, but long story short, capital requirements are gonna increase materially, and that has significant implications for future returns. So for Morgan Stanley trading at 2.3 of tangible, with that overhang in terms of tougher capital requirements, um, I would argue that the valuation here looks relatively full, what prompted us to downgrade the stock at the start of the year. And despite today's move, our view there hasn't really changed. Those risks are not adequately reflected in the stock prices today. Steve, final question. This is an easier one. Can you and I start a petition to change the earnings calendar for the banks? Uh, you can blame Davos. I, I, that's the <laughs> excuse I heard from everyone. Really? Um, that, that was what drove uh, what was admittedly a much busier Friday than we would have liked, especially before the long weekend. Not good. Stephen, thank I you, sir. I will gladly sign that petition. I'm on board. I'll lead the way. Stephen okay. Chubat, thank you very much, so much, buddy. Good to catch up. Broader equity market right now, eight or nine minutes into this, down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a quarter of 1%. The attention will shift from the big banks to big tech. Netflix reporting results on Thursday. Microsoft earnings only a week away. Ed Lundlow on the West Coast. Ed, you're going to be a busy boy. I am, and I know you keep hearing this word, and you're going to hear it from me as well, recession. What's interesting about the technology sector is we're kind of not even yet pricing in an earnings recession, let alone a global economic recession. And really, when it comes to technology, that is the debate. You're right, we're down three-tenths of a percent on the NASDAQ 100, snapping six straight days of gains on that index, which was our longest streak going back to November of 2021. If you take the communication services uh, subsector as an example, if there is a bright spot, it's that we're coming potentially out of this earnings trough. You know, look at the second and third quarter of 2022. The estimate for the fourth quarter or the final three months of last year is a decline of around 19% year on year for EPS growth in the communication services sector, which includes names like Netflix, like Disney, but also includes Alphabet, the parent of Google. And then things start to, I, I guess, improve the first quarter of this year and into the rest of the year. On aggregate, though, if you look at earnings expectations for the NASDAQ 100 for the whole year relative to the S&P 500, I think Bloomberg Intelligence forecasts will drop around 2% on EPS for the year on the NASDAQ versus a 2% gain on the S&P 500. I've been looking at the options market and kind of bracing for what's to come in the coming weeks and in terms of share price moves. But John, I know you like to look at this. Think about this in a market cap move perspective as well, how difficult things were for Apple, for example. There's been optimism of late around Amazon that's been on a really hot streak. Well, what happens if they disappoint to the downside? We could see some big moves in the indexes based on those stocks. And excited for this one. I am. I'm looking forward to your coverage of it. Ed Ludlow there, good friend of this program. He'll lead the way on tech earnings a little bit later into this week and into next week and into early February alongside Caroline Hyde. Equities right now down about two-tenths of 1%. Franklin Templeton, Sean Desai expecting wage growth to stay high and inflation maybe to be stickier than some of you think. Markets still have a glass half full view on wage growth and inflation expectations while various wage growth measures are showing a decelerating trend. The level of wage growth we're seeing is still not consistent with 2 to 3% inflation. Chanel, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. And Chanel, I've got to say, great piece with Barron's over the weekend as well. Enjoyed reading it. And I think the push you're making here is important. You are not with the pack. 
and the pack is shifting towards this idea that inflation is going to rapidly decelerate. Why are you on the other side of that? So I think it's a couple of things. People, uh, there's a little bit of wishful thinking going on as far as I'm concerned because I'm looking at uh, a series of different factors. Number one, this economy is slowing. There's no doubt about it. Definitely, at some stage, the labor markets are going to start showing this impact. However, we're looking probably at a budget deficit of about 5% of GDP this year in an economy which still has unemployment through full employment by a long measure. We continue to see wage growth by its broadest metrics. If you look at anything like the Atlanta Fed uh, indicator of wages, yeah, wage growth is slowing. We're still looking at 7.7% in the last number which came out. And for people who are continuing in the same jobs they have, we're looking at wage growth for around 5.4%. I look at unit labor costs, I look at wage costs, I don't think that's consistent with inflation decelerating as quickly as I think many in the market hope. We definitely are in a different position than where we were at the start of last year, where I really felt out there by myself. But right now, I think, <laughs> still feel there's a little bit too much of optimism in the, in, in the market. I do think that uh, inflation is coming down. I don't think it's going to come down quickly enough for the Fed to essentially A, pause, and B, get to the second half and rapidly start cutting rates. There's a little bit of cognitive dissonance here, right, Jonathan? Sure. In the sense that we're not anticipating a massive recession, because if we were, uh, what, are, what are stocks telling us right now? And on the other hand, uh, if you're not anticipating that recession, why on earth should the Fed rapidly start cutting rates again? It's kind of the issue that I've got as well, Chanel, at the, Chanel, at the moment, too, that I see this rally in EM equities. I see this yeah. rally in European equities. I see this cyclical appetite returning. And for the very same reasons, you should be able to make the argument that yields should be higher, not lower. Yeah. Chanel, shouldn't yields be higher if you believe in this cyclical recovery? Well, yeah, well, I do think yields should be higher. And I also think the type of moves we've seen in 10-year treasuries, you know, periodic 20, 30, 40 basis point moves in a matter of days, of days or weeks, I don't think we've seen the end of that because we're still at a point where markets desperately want to essentially bludgeon the Fed into coming around to their way of thinking. So far, it doesn't look like the Fed is going to agree to do that, in which case, at some stage, the market has to move to the Fed as opposed to the Fed moving to markets. Can I just jump in on that? This is important. Yeah. I see what you see, and that's a reluctance to internalise this shift in central bank behaviour. There is just a belief yeah. they go back to the old playbook. Yeah. So now, what do you think underpins that? So I think it's actually a recency bias. I've been accused of recency bias, by the way, because I think inflation is going to stay higher than most of the market. But I think it's a longer recent, in the sense that after the global financial crisis, the Fed has had, and central banks in general, have had one playbook, and that is, whatever happens, you throw the kitchen sink at the problem. Because there was this massive fear of a second uh, uh, Great Depression. That happened after 2008. Again, after COVID, it was a Great Depression. That's the fear lurking at the back of everyone's minds. And the Fed has had the ability and the lack of constraints to throw the kitchen sink at the problem. This time around, it's not that. And I think that what has happened over the last couple of years this notion that somehow inflation was dead, it was over, there was the famous new normal, secular stagnation, you name it. That's what was supposed to explain why we were never going to get inflation anymore. And in second, a lot of economics work. You have loose fiscal, you have loose monetary, at some stage you're going to get inflation, and inflation has come. So my sense is that central banks are not going to be hasty in pivoting back to the last 15 years, playbook, they're going to take this, and for a period of time, when they cut rates, because of course they will, at some stage, the Fed will cut rates, I don't see them cutting rates all the way down to 1%. I don't see QE again. And there's still this overwhelming perception that as soon as you get a slowdown in the economy, as soon as you see unemployment move up towards 45 close to 5%, yep. Again, we're back to throw, throw everything at the problem. You know something, four and a half, five percent unemployment for this economy is not catastrophic. Yeah, I heard Ken it's Rogoff normal. push back against that a little bit earlier this morning yeah. in Davos. Chanel Desai, this was fantastic as always. It's good to catch Thank up you with so you. Much. Thank you. Great, great being here. Thanks, Jonathan. Bye. Thank you. Coming up, a debt ceiling standoff looming on Capitol Hill. The Senate's going to have to recognize the fact that we're not going to budge.
until we see meaningful reform with respect to spending. That conversation, I'm next. Republicans were elected uh, with a mandate from the American people in the midterm elections. We campaigned on the fact that we were going to be serious about spending cuts. So the Senate's going to have to recognize the fact that we're not going to budge until we see meaningful reform with respect to spending. The battle lines are drawn in D.C. House Republicans demanding spending cuts in return for lifting the debt ceiling. Democrats urging them to focus on future spending bills instead. If you want to debate about future spending, do we want to have defense cuts? Do we want to have spending cuts? That's a legitimate debate. Uh, I will disagree with them, but that's a debate. But you don't debate whether you pay your debts. You don't debate the prestige of the United States. AMH down in D.C. for more. Hey, Anne-Marie. Hey, John. Well, it's going to be a knife fight, and those are the words of Representative Gonzalez over the weekend when it comes to the debt ceiling. We're already seeing, as you call it, the battle lines already being drawn. We know that Republicans want to extract concessions from spending from the Democrats in order to raise the debt ceiling. We know that they want $130 billion cut from the budget. There's also a Washington Post exclusive reporting about the fact that they potentially are planning a payment prioritization um, legislation basically saying you could, we will raise the debt ceiling for some payments and not for others. Besides the logistics of that being difficult, the Democrats are just not going to play ball. President Biden says this will not become a, quote, political football. But already the warning signs are there. We have Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen coming out with a letter saying that marking this Thursday, there's going to have to be these accounting maneuvers in order to make sure that we can continue to pay our debt. So Secretary Yellen's going to have a busy year, that's for sure, because this problem is not going to go away anytime soon. Maybe it's a problem for the summer, later in the summer going into fall, I've got no idea. One thing I do know is that Secretary Yellen is going to head to Switzerland, just not Davos, she's going to Zurich, <laughs> to meet with the Vice Premier of China. We heard from the Vice Premier of China in Switzerland today, and there's this one line that just jumps off the page to me, Anne-Marie, which I think is almost ridiculous. China's fundamental national reality dictates that opening up to the world is a must. We oppose unilateralism and protectionism. China opposes protectionism. How is Secretary Yellen going to take that seriously? It's a difficult question because she's not going to. This is something the United States has obviously been trying to fight. This protectionism -ness in China, this attitude that China has, um, especially when it comes to IP theft and what they're doing in terms of subsidies in their own country. This is something that you know, this is just speaking to a Davos elite crowd, but it's actually not what China practices on the ground. Uh, John, honestly, I know Li Ho is the vice premier is in Davos right now, but the more important meeting is 100 miles away in Zurich. And everyone at Davos wants to know what comes out of this meeting because it's on the heels of President Biden meeting with Xi Jinping at the G20. And we do know that Secretary Yellen is really a proponent of this so-called friendshoring. The fact that she wants to bring supply chains away from China. Also, the United States is trying to coalesce allies to go on board with their curbs of advanced technology against China. Yep. And they're doing that today with the Netherlands. And there's some tension between the Europeans, you mentioned the Dutch, some tension between the Europeans and the Americans at the same time, which maybe is a theme we should be pondering a little bit more. And Marie, thank you. Down in Washington, what a week still ahead. What a 24 hours for Secretary Yellen. Equities right now, basically unchanged on the S&P for some sector price action. Just quickly, here's Kaylee. Well, John, the index is flat because the gainers are completely offsetting the decliners. The big decliners being communication services down a percent, financials down about eight tenths as well. The outperformance, though, coming from energy, that sector at more than one percent with WTI back above $81 a barrel. And just pointing it out because it's Bloomberg Crypto Day, John, a lot of crypto-related equities rallying, too, with Bitcoin in the middle of its longest winning streak since November 2013. You've got five seconds. Promo the show. Go on. 1 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be talking regulation with the CFTC Commissioner, John. Can't wait, Kaylee. Looking forward <laughs> to it. Thank you. From New York, your trading diary. Up next. <laughs> Just ran the numbers quickly in the commercial break. Five day winning streak on the SP would be the longest winning streak on the S&P on a daily basis going all the way back to November 2021.
believe it or not. That's the price action, slightly positive. Let's get you the trading diary. John Williams of the New York Fed speaking at 3 p.m. Eastern. BOJ, a rate decision coming up Wednesday, plus U.S. retail sales and PPI numbers too. Lots of Fed speak. Bostick, Harker, Logan coming up later this week. Jobless claims on Thursday. Netflix numbers on Thursday too. And closing out the week with existing home sales on Friday. From New York, that does it for me. Good to be back. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.